Edgar Rao, OG Self back here, and today I have a tale of victory, I have a tale of glory, a few strong, focused men banded together to ensure they gave the youngins the proper leadership and mentorship to thrive properly in this world of savage beasts and barbarians. Hey guys, this video today is all about reaching deep inside of yourself to find love and heal your inner child. The little scared boy that all of us have in us. And before you say, before you say it, just let me address the 800 pound gorilla in the room. A lot of you guys are saying, Hey yo, see you back. When a person says, oh, we're relating to a group or segment, they, they sound ignorant, stupid, and dumb. Because no one can say all about anything because they haven't experienced any all of the topic. And I agree. And while normally that is true, this video is about the one exception. When it is not, and, here, and, and here's why. When it comes to men, real men, who are in touch with their masculinity and all that it entails in our society, with the societal norms of being big, strong, successful, and a provider, and a protector of your loved ones, and the weak who can't protect themselves. These type of men all have a little scared boy inside of them, who don't want to be, who who wants to be big and strong and scary and mean, so that he doesn't have to be afraid of being picked on, bullied, hurt, or killed. So how do I know? You might ask, because I was that little scared and fearful little boy who was picked on, bullied, and afraid to get killed as there was murder and mayhem all in my life growing up poor, little, and sick and weak in the hood in the concrete jungles of the major cities back east in America. I remember vividly as a little five-year-old boy having to follow my father and uncles and cousins down the mountainous ranges of Kiwas in Puerto Rico being told to look out for cannibals and animals as we made it through the jungle on our way to the beach in order to go fishing so we would have meat for the rest of the week to go with our vegetables and fruit. I remember the fear of moving to the big and scary concrete jungles and mean streets of New York City getting my ass kicked because I was light-skinned and pretty like Prince and I couldn't, eat, I couldn't speak English. So my dad put me into martial arts school studying Taekwondo at the local community center. And I also vividly remember the horror I felt as a little seven-year-old boy when my father, who was our protector and leader and provider, went to prison for five years with his two brothers for a fell bank robbery when he got tired of working five low-paying dishwashing and janitorial jobs. I particularly remember the fear and uncertainty, <coughs> excuse me, of moving from town to town in Detroit, Chicago, and Philly, trying to find a West Indian relative of my mom's who was financially stable enough to take my teenage mom in with me and my little brother. I remember the short-lived relief when we finally settled down in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania with an aunt who had a big enough place to allow us to stay with her sleeping on the floor with blankets in the wintertime while my mom applied for welfare and food stamps. I also remember vividly um, shaking and freezing while standing in line outside the welfare office in the wintertime to get inside the warm welfare office to get our welfare checks and food stamps and government issued cheese, five pounds of rice, five pound bag of beans, and a five pound bag of potatoes. All the while listening to my mom scream and yell and argue with other young girls with little kids who were trying to cut in front of us in line to get out of the freezing cold of those back east winters, man. And all I can remember thinking to myself was, Hey, when is my, where's my dad? Why did he leave us? And when is he coming back? And most importantly, how come there are no men to help me, my mom, and me, and my small little, and my small little brother? For the next two years from seven to nine, all I can remember was the fear of being chased to school, by the big, mean, um, rabbit, street dogs, street cats, and street rats, where they're just as big as cats, and just as hungry. And how I never felt, as soon as I got safely close, 
closer to the school, the big dark-skinned black kids would then kick my ass because I was all red-faced like a white dude from running in the snow, running from the big rabid dogs, cats, rats, and oh yeah, the big flying cockroaches in the hood. So after processing through the armed security with metal detectors at the front doors of the school, I would then get beat up and bullied at my locker by the dark-skinned black girls who liked me and wanted to be my girlfriend, but I was too shy to say anything because I couldn't speak English and I had a speech impediment. So they took it as like I was snubbing them, but I wasn't. And all the time I kept thinking to myself, I can't wait until I'm all grown up because then I won't be bullied and beat up. Well, it wasn't until I was 10 years old that one of my dad's brothers got out of the pen as he had less time as he was only the driver and he didn't actually go into the bank with the guns. So not only was he tall and muscular with muscles popping out all over, he was mean and tough looking with a broken nose and missing teeth. He was my very first mentor and turned me on to weightlifting and, and buying my brothers and cousins and I a weight bench and a 110 pound plastic coated concrete weight set with barbells, dumbbells, and an instruction course on how to lift the weights properly. Then he also taught all of us how to box and dirty prison fight called cheating. As he said, there are no rules when fighting in the street or in prison, so you got to fight to win by any means necessary. So for the next three years, we all lifted weights every day after school, practiced martial arts, boxing, and dirty fighting with each other, which I got to use every day as I still was getting chased to school and home as my cousins were older than me and went to a different school. But through my uncle's mentorship and leadership, I learned to be tough as he told me, as long as the kid keeps hitting you, you just keep kicking and punching him back and eventually he will get tired of getting hit because you are a fighter and fighters never quit. Even though I tried to get on the sports team, I was too small from having sickle cell anemia and asthma and never made it, you know, even though I tried out. But at least I did get to play sports with my cousins in the hood, watching them fight and kick ass. Um, if some, if, if some, if somebody fouled them or threw an elbow that was too hard while playing basketball. But they were all bigger and taller and stronger than me. It wasn't until my dad got out of prison when I was just a five foot six, 130 pound skinny 13-year-old weak straight-A student when my dad came home from prison that I got my second mentor and my second leader. It was my dad. And as my dad was now even bigger than my uncle with muscles popping out all over but without the broken nose and missing teeth, it was then that he told me to stop studying and worrying about grades and book knowledge because that's the white man knowledge but to instead work out harder and functioning on my body and to fight more so I can be big and strong and be, be king of the streets and to go out and dominate the streets because he was a gangster and I was the son of a gangster and gangsters man what they do is they dominate rob and kill and subjugate so I turned down my two full scholarships to Carnegie Mellon University for mathematics and to the Art Institute of Pittsburgh for because I was an artistic genius and I started robbing people, cutting class, holding up jewelry stores, and shoplifting from department stores. So I could get, start selling the selling um, watches and jewelry to the, 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 the gangsters and drug dealers and pimps on the street. Which landed me in YA for 18 months after going to juvenile hall several times for like 2 to 4 months on minor beefs. It wasn't until I was in YA I had some big homies who were then my mentors and leaders who turned me on to Arnold Schwarzenegger's workout course, and we would study it daily and use it when we worked out every day. While in YA eating the three hot state-issued meal meals and working out hard and heavy, my big homie mentors taught me about more dirty fighting, how to make weapons in YA, how to knock fools out with a single punch, and how to be a booty bandit as they knocked out and raped and turned out soft, weak, unaffiliated boys who were unlucky enough to come to YA without muscles or fighting skills and didn't have any big homies or associations. I quickly realized that I did not want to learn that as they would hold down 
a little wimpy dude who was waking up from being knocked out to find out he was having a train ran on his butthole gangbang style. When they made me go up in the in his butthole for sloppy fifths, as there was four guys in front of me, and when I told them I didn't want to do it, they said, hey, little homie, this is how it works in the pen. Either you're a predator or you're a prey. You either go up and do his butthole or the homies are going to go up in your butthole. So then it's then that I realized only the big, strong, crazy, and mean people make it in this world. Since I had a growth spurt in YA going from 5'6", 130 pounds to 5'10", 168 pounds, I now had enough height, weight, and muscle to be sleepy fools with my one-punch hitter-quitter that the big homies taught me. So when I finally got out of YA, guys, at the tail end of my 15 years on this planet, when I turned 16, I was allowed back into the public school and was now able to play sports, lettering and track, track and field, swimming, baseball, basketball, boxing, wrestling, and karate. I was just so gifted now because I didn't have sickle cell anemia and I didn't have asthma anymore. And all those years of lifting weights and working out from 10 up until this time prepared me to dominate everybody on the athletic field. But the following year, I wasn't satisfied. I wanted to get the hottest girls who, who only like football players. So I switched over to football, and because of my speed, they made me a fullback. And I got my left leg broke going up the middle as a fullback during the game, losing all of my scholarship potential. So at 17, I joined the military and got mentored in positive things by Arnold Schwarzenegger, Tom Platts, Mike Christensen, Dr. Squat Fed Hatfield, and Lee Haney, as well as Sergeant Lobbies and the other sergeants and captains and generals and colonels in the Special Forces Rangers. I had a great life doing bodybuilding, powerlifting, martial arts, bouncing, and bodyguarding, and as well on my way to becoming an extra in the movies. It wasn't until, until um, my platoon sergeant in 1990, prior to going to Desert Storm, suggested that we get crack cocaine to get amped up before deploying to battle that all my positive mentorship went wrong. So young guys, be very careful who you choose to listen to and follow as a leader. And only have mentors, leaders, and associates in association with people and, and do business with people who are telling you good and positive things and ways to make money. Because in this life, guys, youth is your greatest, is your greatest asset, guys. See, when you're a young guy, see, there's a lot of older people that say youth is wasted on the young. And the reason they say that because when you're young, dude, and you got the little dude inside of you, even if you become a teenager, some guys develop very quickly, become big, strong teenagers, but their mentals are that of a little boy. It's just like when you see these hot girls now, they're like 16, 17, 18, whatever, for you guys who want to be talking that fucking child molester shit, dude. Hey, man, let me tell you something. In some countries... A, 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 a girl is a woman at 14, dude. Trust me, man. My mom got married to my dad, man, when she was fucking 14 in Puerto Rico. So you guys that don't never travel, shut the fuck up. I'm just saying, if you look at any MGTOW charts about a woman's, man, sexual market value, any SMVs, it says from 24, no, it says from 14 to 24. That is their peak years where they're blossoming as women. From 25 to 29, dude, that's when they're about approaching the wall because 30 is the wall. And most women been ran through by then. So all I'm saying is, dude, like, when you're a young dude, man, you don't have the early blossoming of a young girl, but you have your, your blossoming potential, and you, you get to scare little dude. And because you, you notice, like, at 14, or as you're a teenager, there's a lot of guys that are bigger and stronger than you. So you're looking for leadership. You're looking for mentorship. You're looking for somebody to tell you how to be and how to become a man. I know. It's the teenage periods that's going through puberty, right? But the problem in most hoods... In Vario's homes, as the, the leaders that are telling you this stuff, man, their lives are in disarray. Yeah, maybe they might be the head gang member, they might be the shot caller, they might be running stuff, they might be a drug dealer, they might even be a pimp or a gangster. You got to look at your life, you got to figure out what you want to do with your life, guys. And then you have to find the right leader or mentor to follow, because if you follow the wrong guy, you're going to end up in the Penta homes, or maybe even under the pent, or maybe dead. And that's why I'm making this video, guys. Because I saw a lot of guys when I was in prison, guys, a lot of young dudes coming in. I saw mostly a lot of dudes, 17, 18, 19, coming in the pen with a lot of years. Let's say you're coming in with 10, 20 years, right? 
And so then when you get to the pen, dude, you're wasting all these years of your life, bro. And then when you when you get out, man, you're bitter inside, man. So then you see another, now, you, now you're a big homie. You see another young dude, 17, 18, 19. And you're telling him the same things you got told, perpetuating the cycle and messing his life off too. So what I'm saying to you young homies is this, man. When you're looking for a leader, because you got the little dude inside that maybe your father wasn't there, your mom didn't raise you in a nice neighborhood, nobody loved you and coddled you, it's your job now with the age of reckoning to look inside the little dude and, and be the best parent for him, be the best father for him, be the best leader for him. And how do you do that, guys? You find the best leaders and mentors to guide you in your walk in this life. And how do you determine if a leader or a mentor is good? There's a number one way, dude. You look at his actions, you look at his deeds, you look at his lifestyle, homie. If a guy that's telling you to, to put in work or do something, and you look at him, dude, and he's not living the life that you want to live, like you look at his you look at his car, you look at his clothes, you look at his jewelry, you look at his bank account, dude, you look at the circles, is he traveling or not? You know, does he have a lot of hot women? Does he have investments, dude? Does he have a big baller car and a big baller house? If the answer is no, you want to quickly reevaluate why you want to follow this guy? Why you want him to be your leader? And I'm making this video because a lot of guys grew up like me without a dad, or you grew up in the hood, or the barrio, or you grew up with a single mom, and you don't have a leader, or a mentor, or a good teacher, or the most important one, guys, I'm talking about, is a role model. That is real mentorship. A role model is somebody that you want to model as you're a little dude going through the teenage period to become a big dude. You want to look at your role model, it's like, that is the model, that is the mold that I want to perpetuate because I like the outcome of his life. And even your your older guys, like in your 20s and 30s, even 40s or 50s, dude, if somebody comes to you, man, with a business proposition, man, or comes to you with an affiliation or an alliance, you got to look at the dude and say to yourself, man, what does dude represent in his life? If this dude is a solid businessman in the community, it's been the corporate America, been making money legally, dude, for decades, dude, not for a month or a week or a day or years, decades. You got to say to yourself, man, change is a good thing. Change is a constant. Here's why. This is what I tell all my little nephews, man, and nieces, man, when they come to me for advice. When Because some of them still in the hood. I left back these guys because I had to move away from that madness or I'd be under the pen because there's just so much madness. You got so many loose cannons and just silly motherfuckers back there. You lose your life with so much black on black, brown on brown, yellow on yellow, white on white, genocide, murder, and madness, dude. You never get anywhere, man. So I left up out of there, man. I got smart. But a lot of my nieces and nephews that ask me, like, hey, man, what should I do? You know, they call me, you know what I mean? They call me uncle, right? I tell them like this, man. No, they call me, they call me Tio. I tell them like this. I say, hey, man, the first thing you got to do is find an opportunity, whether you got to go to Job Corps, you got to go to, a, 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 you know, try to get a scholarship to go to college, or you got to get a job in another city to take a promotion. Get the fuck out of your town, man. Because bad association spoils useful habits. And what happens when you're a youngster, man, you're looking for a mentor and a teacher. The only people you got in the hood to look up to, man, are people that are big-time drug dealers, gangsters, uh, criminals, pimps, or gang members, man. And that's leading you down a path of destruction, man. And I understand if that's the environment you're from, I got it. But, dude, sometimes you got to look at your life, man. You got to look for other mentors and teachers outside of your circle. So I'll give you an example. Let's just say you're an older dude and you're from a hood. Let's say you put in work and you used to be a shot caller. You're still in the, in the hood with your homies. But you have an opportunity to learn some skills and some sets outside of what you've already experienced. That'll take you to the next level. And here's why, guys. It's okay to try new things, dude, and it's okay to fail because that's how you learn. You learn from failure, man. Nobody starts out doing anything new and knowing it and being a master of it. That's just not the way it works. This ain't a fucking movie. This ain't fucking Karate Kid. You get a poor dude studying martial arts for a month. Now he's a fucking world champion, and he's been beating dudes that have been doing martial arts from the time they was five until they're like fucking 16, and he can't move it. He moves into a new town at 15. He's been studying martial arts for a month. And now he's the fucking master. Hey, life don't work like that, homie. So what I'm saying is you have an opportunity to look at a dude's actions and their behaviors 
And if there's if, if it's different from you in a positive way, you should always take a chance because this is how life works, homie. Everybody thinks, man, young dudes in their 20s and 30s, even in their 40s and 50s think like, oh, you know, opportunity, you know, oh, opportunity is going to, you know, opportunity knocks, you know, opportunity going to keep, man, sometimes opportunity only knocks once. And it's that one opportunity that you pass up five years from now, ten years from now, you'd be kicking yourself in the ass. I'm going to show you guys some pictures. I actually, I actually used to work with Elon Musk, and he offered me to go to PayPal with him when I was working at Zip2, but I was on parole. I needed to have a steady job or I'd get violated. I couldn't afford to be jumping from startup to startup. I didn't go. That was one of the biggest mistakes of my life. Another one, I, I had the opportunity to meet Bill Gates. I'll show you guys pictures. He asked me to move to Washington State. To work with him. When I got off parole I didn't. I was afraid. And I didn't. I kicked myself in the ass. And I had other opportunities. I had homies that were models. And into acting and stuff. And I was just so. I was just so focused on bodybuilding and martial arts. I thought I was going to be Mr. Olympia dude. And I passed up those opportunities. So what I'm saying guys. When the opportunity comes your way. Let me tell you what happens to me guys. You guys, you guys already know I got my insurance license. That opportunity came to me. When I decided to get out of IT, it just came to me. It just because, I mean, when a student is ready to teach or repair. But then I got another opportunity to do digital marketing. I met this millionaire dude who's in the Illuminati, dude. I don't know if you know what that means, but I met him through martial arts because when I go to LA and stuff, all these guys are doing extras in martial arts. A lot of them are highly trained martial arts. Some of them are like CIA hitmen. Some are bodyguards. Some are bouncers. Some are even uh, bounty hunters. You get to meet a lot of different people, square dudes that do martial arts. That's why I want to tell you guys, all square dudes ain't busters and bitches, homie, and chumps and pussies, man. If you're going to be, if, this is what I say, if you want to join a gang or you want to join something bigger than yourself, I tell people it all this time, man. Become a fucking police officer, man. Be become a fucking correctional officer, man. Become a sheriff, man. You know, join the military, dude. Become a fucking politician, man. Those are all gangs, too. But they're positive games where you can make money and you get so much money and power that then if you decide to do illegal things, it's less of a ramification. Am I telling you to be successful to do illegal things? No, but I'm telling you, if you want to join a gang or association or something bigger than yourself, join a group or an affiliation that's doing positive things, dude, where you can get your education and your money because money buffers you from the harsh realities of the world. So when you look at people coming to you, man, trying to build associations or, you know, business opportunities or they want to be a mentor to you or a leader, man, look at their lifestyle, dude. If, and the guy who's trying to tell you something what to do, if you're looking at him and you, you're not saying to yourself, hey, I want to be just like this guy or there's some positive things I can learn from this guy, then don't do it. Don't. That's the prime indicator, guys. And that's why you got to be careful who you let be your leaders and shot callers, because the most important thing, sometimes they don't have your best interest in heart. And that's all I want to say to you guys. When you when you got a leader or a shot caller or a mentor or a teacher, you're looking to have mentorship or leadership, first check in with the little dude inside, man, the little scared boy who wants to be protected, dude, who wants to grow up and be big and strong, who doesn't want to live in fear anymore. And if what they're telling you doesn't resonate, with keeping the little dude inside protected and safe, then not only would I not do it, I would find a way to be dip diplomatic about getting out of that association and moving to maybe another area where you don't have to interact with them type of cats who are trying to tell you negative things, homie. Because when if their life is fucked up, what makes you think they give a shit about your life? If you got an OG or a shot caller or a mentor or a homie whose life is fucked off, he's got life in prison, or he's been in out of prison so much he's he's fucking institutionalized, dude, and he's living off of his Heine homes, you know what I mean? And he's got a beat up car, man, and the motherfucker ain't got, you know what I mean? He ain't got no social skills where he's traveling to other countries and making investments, man. You want to reevaluate that situation and maybe look at relocation, man. But I, I, I encourage you guys to come to my channel, man. Thumbs up the video, man. Make a comment. Subscribe, man, to my channel. Hit the notification bell. Most importantly, share my videos, man. Get the word out, man. 2021 is coming. We under the COVID-19. Everybody's sitting back talking about, hey, I can't wait till this is over. Man, this is my reality about being locked down on COVID-19. It is what it is. Take what you have with where you are. Make the best out of it. How you do that, man? You come to the OG Silverback channel, man. Subscribe to my Patreon, man. 
get a coaching call, man, so then I can talk to you about getting on the isogenics program. Because let me tell you something, the most important thing that I did, my best number one mentor was my uncle when he came out of the pen and he taught me about weightlifting. My dad had already taught me about martial arts before he left. And let me just tell you something, man, martial arts is good. But man, martial arts without having a sound foundation of a strong body, dude, you got to fight a lot longer and a lot harder than if you got the one hit or quitter like I got when I put on all that muscle. And so until next time, OG Silverback, out.